if that doesn't go right, things get worse from here. Mm -hmm. You guys can go to Mrs. Price's class. Good morning. Uh, open to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Okay. Uh, John chapter 12, uh, ver we'll start, go to verse 37. Uh, John 12, 37 says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, speaking of Jesus, uh, before the people, but in particular before the Pharisees and uh, the scribes, uh, yet they believed not on him, uh, that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, uh, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. And then these things spake, or these things said Isaiah, or Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. Um, well, we'll look at read verse 32. Verse 42, I'm sorry. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him uh, because of the Pharisees. Uh, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Uh, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Um, but verse 41, a uh, key thing here, it says, Okay, these things said Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him, um, it's not, there's not a cross, well, maybe your Bible has a cross reference here, but um, when did Isaiah see Jesus' glory? When he was, when he was in the Isaiah, Isaiah 6. Okay. If we, well, go, go back to Isaiah 6. Go back to Isaiah 6. We'll start at verse 1. It says, in, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord uh, sitted, sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And uh, above it said seraphim, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And all, uh, one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Uh, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried in the house was filled with smoke. Then said, I woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Uh, and then, well, we'll continue reading here until verse 9. It says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon his mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? Uh, then said I, Here am I, send me. Then he, he gets his commission here. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but and understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. There's, if you notice, when the word Lord is used, it 
transitions back and forth in this passage between the first letter capitalized or all the letters capitalized. I mean, it seems kind of silly, but like, what does that mean? And then, in particular, uh, to who he was referencing. In Isaiah? Yes. Capitalizing the beginning of each phrase. Just with the word Lord. Oh. With the all caps, it's, it's Jehovah. Jehovah, yeah. If it's, it's usually Adonai if it's the initial cap. It's, it's still referencing the same person, but he's addressing an aspect of the I don't know, it just means he's like a master or ruler, like governor, hey sir. But nevertheless, he's still God. It's still addressing the fact that he, it's, it's addressing like his character, his position, rather than like him, who he is. Jehovah is actually, that's I am that I am. When he revealed himself to um, Moses at the burning bush. Good morning. Um, we're in Isaiah 6 right now, but then we're going to go back to John chapter 12. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, one is more of a title rather than his name, and then Jehovah being that's who he is, that's his name. That's what he told Moses when he showed himself to Moses in the burning bush, uh, saying, I am that I am, and tell him that I am that I am sent you. In other words, that, that's, that's his actual, uh, you could say his, his personal name. He's, that he's Almighty God. Uh, there's a point where I'm going with this. Okay, so in other words, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he realized, okay, this is God Almighty. It was, you know, this is Creator God. This is Jehovah God, Creator, speaking to me. Because uh, he points that out. And actually, his testimony is in verse 3, that the seraphim that are flying around crying out, Holy, 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 um, they said, the Lord of hosts. So this individual that he saw in the uh, which, whose train filled the temple, uh, whose glory filled the house, uh, who caused the posts to shake, this is Jehovah God Almighty. Okay? Um, if we go back to John chapter 12, we're kind of jumping in the middle of a context. Jesus had been arguing with the scribes and Pharisees with regard. They were basically addressing, they were attacking him because they were, you know, being critical as, as they were in, uh, confronting him with regard to, you know, who are you to do these miracles? Who are you to, what kind of authority do you have here and such? Um, and it says with regard to them, um, but though he had done many miracles before them, yet they believed not. And it's because they hardened their hearts. Uh, so in other words, they, as with what we'd see in the pattern in Romans 1, when they saw God um, for who he was, they, you know, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And then they became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. And so they reject what light they had. So the only alternative they have is to turn to darkness. And then they, they're walking in darkness, rejecting what is very plainly before their eyes, God Almighty in flesh. Well, who blinded their eyes? Well, in verse, 40. In verse 40 says, He blinded their eyes. He had blinded their mm -hmm. eyes. God had blinded. God, God had blinded their eyes. But really, in reality, it's they blinded themselves. In other words, He gave them over. Like his verse, yeah. 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 But, yes. Uh, speaking of the Calvinists, if you look back, the first first people that first person that God blinded his eyes was Pharaoh, and if you read this account in Exodus, Pharaoh blind, uh, Pharaoh refused to let the people go three times before uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Excuse me, three times, and then it says after the fourth time it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So I think that's a, there's a pattern there that we always we, if we harden our hearts first, then God may harden us, but God doesn't just arbitrarily harden people's hearts. No, he doesn't. It, it's the same pattern with Romans 1, that they they reject first, and then they, uh, you know, they turn. They don't have any alternative to turn to but darkness because they've rejected light. So it's, it's, it's all the miracles right there in front of their faces. That was, that was firsthand proof that 
that Jesus was who he said he was. Yes. And I, I've brought this up before, but the point of distinction that says here, actually it doesn't use, use with the exception of um, verse 38, where they actually quote Isaiah. Um, actually, they quote Isaiah 53. Where it says the saying that the saying of Isaiah uh, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. Go to Isaiah 53 real quick. Isaiah 53. Now, mind you, he's directly quoting Isaiah. Uh, you know, and then verse 1 it says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, in Isaiah 53, it's all capitalized. In the New Testament, granted, it's a different language, uh, it's only the first letter capitalized. The, the, the only reason I'm pointing that out is because you'll have some people that get a nitpick argue. It's two different words, and in Correct me if I'm wrong here, and I'll put this out as a challenge. Even in direct quotations of Old Testament scripture that actually use the word Jehovah with regard to one that's referencing the Lord, uh, you will not find one instance in the New Testament where they have it all capitalized because there's no equivalent for it in Greek. They only have one word that they use. There's actually two words that they use in Greek language overall as far as during that period of time but the main word that they would have used would have been kurios, which is just Lord, which basically would be your equivalent of Adonai. So in other words, when you are reading passages that reference directly as far as Jehovah in your New Testament, be it from a direct quotation, or sometimes when you, you, know, you see, um, well, Philippians 2 is actually one of the better examples, but even Romans 10, 9, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, Context is what it's going to be the determiner as to whether or not it's referencing Jehovah specifically. Yes, sir. There is one uh, word in the New Testament that's used uh, that's closest to Jehovah, and that's Jesus or uh, Ye and Yesu. Yes. Two different forms of it. Yes. The, I guess the, what I was trying to point out is that some people argue Jesus. In other words. <laughs> yes. Some people are going to argue that okay, oh, uh, they, they make a point. Calvinistic leaning individuals usually make a point of it that with regard to Lordship salvation is why they make that argument, that distinction there. The founder of uh, Welch's great, great Jew, uh, Jews was a Christian. He wrote a book called Jesus is Jehovah. Oh, really? I, I haven't seen it in quite a while. Okay. That would be interesting to go ahead and take a look at. That's really neat. Um, no, back to John chapter 12. Okay, so... Even though it's first letter capitalized small, small, it's actually, this is speaking of Jehovah, okay? And then when we read in verse 41 that these things said Isaiah, uh, when he saw his glory and spake of him, uh, in other words, he's referencing, he saw God's glory and he spake of God, but he's speaking of Jesus, because he's direct, that's the direct, that, that would be your antecedent, in other words. How did Isaiah speak of Jesus and see his glory? When you go back and you read that, it's okay, it's Jehovah that he actually witnessed and recorded that accounting. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. All right, so going the John chapter 12, he saw... God's glory, but he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus in his glory. He saw, and he, he recorded it. He spake of him. Okay, we go back to uh, Isaiah 6, and we see, okay, it speaks of that he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and then, you know, the seraphim crying around, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Uh, so it's speaking of Jehovah. So in other words, the idea here is basically Jesus is Jehovah. Okay, that's, that's the point I'm trying to bring out. So, why I mention this is, this is one of the very few passages that are still found in your New World Translation, 
which we wouldn't use, obviously. It's a perverted translation put out by the Jehovah's Witnesses. And what I was going to address today was just some of the error that we can find. This is a cursory overview as far as what you would encounter uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, their belief system. Um, up to this point, we've already been reviewing some things with regard to essentials of salvation. Uh, and I guess what would be considered fundamentals of the faith, which, uh, just to kind of go over quickly, was first of all, that the Bible is the Word of God, uh, and then, you know, there was a necessary uh, blood atonement to be made, uh, that Jesus Christ is actually God, he's, he's, he's God Almighty, so you have to believe in the deity of Christ. Uh, then, obviously, um, one of the things that's kind of arguably would be like maybe necessity of miracles, but that's kind of, that would be kind of, that would be understood. And then you have his uh, bodily uh, resurrection and imminent return. And with regard to Jehovah's Witnesses, they were started by a gentleman by the name of Charles Taze Russell. Uh, and they've gone through a number of revision with regard to their um, belief system, but they primarily see Jesus as not God himself. In other words, they see him as a created being, uh, an individual that is God-like, but he's not God Almighty. He's not the creator. They make a distinguishment between Jehovah, the Father, and Jesus. Jesus is not Jehovah. And this would be one of the few passages that you will find that is untouched or unperverted in their translation. Uh, which, by the way, I don't recommend you would ever, um, if you're going to argue with them, or if you're going to uh, undertake interacting with them with, with regard to uh, what Scripture teaches. Uh, most of the New Testament passages that they go to, uh, they've altered and perverted from their translation viewpoint. This is just one of the few uh, where you can you can refer to and be like, okay, how is it that? Uh, and it's actually referenced. It, it would have a cross-reference because it's pretty clear, okay, this is Isaiah 6. So how is it that Isaiah saw Jesus high and lifted up and his, you know, drank in the temple and then he spake of his glory? How is that the case? Uh, when if you go back, it very clearly says, okay, it's Jehovah that was you know, high and lifted up, and they're crying, the seraphim are crying out, holy, holy, holy. So it just points out that, yes, sir? There's a, another verse you can use with Jehovah's Witnesses, and that's 1 Corinthians 10, 9. It says, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed in the serpents. It's referring to Exodus 21, where Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. But uh, in, in, in the... In, I'm sorry, I can't talk this morning. No, that's fine. In Exodus, or in um, Numbers, it's Numbers 21. In Numbers, it says tempt, they tempted Jehovah. But here it says they tempted Christ. Well, in the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible, they changed it. They said, neither let us tempt Jehovah. But every New Testament text reads Christ there, Christos. Christos. So, you know, they, they, they're caught in their own trap there. Yeah. Definitely. That's good. <laughs> That's really good stuff. They translated Christ as Jehovah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's funny. Because it's not even the same word. But it's... That's who he is. But that's it's, it's interesting that they would have done that. A few interesting viewpoints with regard to what they believe. Obviously, okay, we've addressed the fact that they don't have uh, the same belief system with regard to Christ. They don't believe. They don't see him as God Almighty. Uh, with regard to kingdom, God's kingdom, they actually don't believe in uh, eternal lake of fire. They don't believe in. They would. They would have a call it soul sleep, which, quite honestly, I don't understand even from reading some of the literature that they have. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> you're you basically transition off, but if you're a faithful individual, uh, which actually they provide some with regard to it's only the 144,000 that were supposed to be uh, uh, chosen uh, by Jehovah Himself as far as to be found faithful to go ahead and continue on into His kingdom, then uh, then you would continue on and you would. Um, they like to use the verse in Psalms where the meek shall inherit the earth. So 
In other words, if you're found meek and faithful to God, um, then you you know you're going to be living here on earth. In other words, God's not going to destroy the earth. Which, if you go to Peter, Second uh, Peter in particular, Second Peter three, that that's very clear that God's going to do that. You know, He's going to, um, you know, the elements shall melt with the fervent heat. Uh, you have also the fact that with regard to salvation itself, it's essentially works. That's one thing that you're going to find um, with every other false uh, religion, false, and basically cult that you get that's out there, regardless of whatever idiosyncrasy that they want to spin as to why they're distinct from somebody else. The fact is that it all comes down to the same root issue is the fact that they believe that they're good enough to be acceptable to God, um, be it by how well they live um, or some kind of ritual uh, system that they have to go ahead and follow. Uh, Mormons are really big on that as well. Um, to be quite honest with you, even, well, we'll, we'll look at Islam uh, in a few weeks, but they... <laughs> that's, that's a little creepy with them because they don't really know uh, well, actually, nobody, we do, but they wouldn't know, none, none of the other false religions uh, would know, but nevertheless, they don't have an assurance of the fact that they would be before God, you know, to be accepted of him, uh, regardless of how well they live. They are hopeful that, you know, what I've done is going to be good enough, uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's, that's what their stance is with regard to salvation, is that they would go forth and if they live good enough, if they follow or adhere um, certain tenets, that they will be accepted of God. Which the Bible is very clear on that, that it's not a matter of works of righteousness which we have done, but it's by His, you know, it's by His mercy, by His grace that He saves us as uh, by faith. With regard to the 144,000, they don't argue this that much anymore. Most of the ones that I've ever personally had argued with, um, or had an opportunity to be able to go ahead and try and share the gospel with, most of the time we just only deal with the deity of Christ uh, issue. So anytime you really get an opportunity to be able to talk with them, um, if you can just follow them down to the deity of Christ, then you can spend most of your time there because everything else is kind of like. Uh, superfluous. It's not. You, I mean, you, you can try and argue the 144,000. Pastor has gone over some of this, and that is, is that uh, in Revelation they are of the 12 tribes. So literally, they're they're Jews, but in particular, they're male, and they're um, they're also virgins. So in other words, they're individuals that have never been with a woman and they uh, are per particularly ethnically Jewish as well as um, obviously religiously they're believing Jews and then also they're called out by God in particular so that they would witness or go evangelize during the tribulation period. Uh, so that's a specific calling of a specific group of people by God uh, that have, you know, believed on him, uh, but that's who they are. They're not uh, spiritualized individuals as they would like to. Okay, yeah, here, here's what's written with regard to that. It says, based on a literal interpretation, excuse me, literal interpretation of scriptures such as uh, Revelation 14, 1 through 4, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that exactly 144,000 faithful Christians uh, go to heaven as spirit creatures to rule with Christ in the kingdom of God. Okay, they believe that most of these are already in heaven and that the remnant at Revelation 12, 17 uh, refers to those remaining alive on earth who will be immediately resurrected to heaven uh, when they die. Uh, witnesses understand Jesus' words at John 3. So the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God to apply to the 144,000 who are born again as 
anointed sons of God in heaven. And then the associate terms, Israel of God, um, which we've seen Galatians 6.16, and little flock in Luke 12.32, and the bride of lamb's wife, uh, Revelation 21.9, in the New Testament with anointed. Okay, so they basically take, like anybody else, they take scripture and they twist it. But they don't... Uh, They don't apply it uh, properly is why they end up where they stand with regard to what they do with regard not only to the fact that, okay, there is life after death, uh, there is uh, eternal judgment for one to face, and then also the fact that uh, Christ is God Almighty. You know, he's Jesus, Jesus is Jehovah. Uh, we'll start at verse 1 just to get to the context. We're going to be looking at verse 9. It says, uh, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Okay, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Uh, for they bear, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Uh, for Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. and But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, uh, Say not in thy heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? Uh, the word is nigh even thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And this is, this is, this is what it is. Okay? It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe and shall believe in the heart uh, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then, you know, for the Lord. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth uh, confession is made unto salvation. Okay, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay, for there's no difference between the Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Uh, for whosoever shall uh, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here's the distinguishment that he puts between what the Jews at that time, why, well, for that matter, really anybody, it's not just specific to Jews, even though in the context is addressing the fact that the Jews uh, were seeking about to establish their own righteousness by works, which clearly, you know, scripture uh, from way back in the beginning teaches very differently. And that is, is that it's, uh, it's a faith issue. You, you, receive salvation by faith. And here's what he said, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, can then believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, uh, thou shalt be saved. Um, so the deity of Christ is essential, and that's pointed out here because he says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or you can you can put it the same way, and it wouldn't do any injustice in Scripture, it says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is the Lord. In other words, that Jesus is... Jehovah. It would be it would be the same difference in other words. It's it's still accurate to the grammatical structure of the passage here. In other words, so for someone to be born again, they would have to believe Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is God. Okay, Jesus is Almighty Creator God. Okay, and then in particular here it says that, that God hath raised him from the dead. So 
your death, burial, resurrection, how you talked about in Corinthians, um, verses 2 and 3, or 3 and 4. But uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 15. So, when dealing with, uh, well, we're looking today in particular to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, but with any false religion or any cult, uh, that is going to be a key issue. It's going to be a, a thing upon which uh, you're going to find yourself like, well, okay, they might have uh, a lot of the same terminology and they might have a lot of the same, it seems, belief systems and certain things, but the fact is that they don't agree on, uh, and they're very adamant, usually very, the fact that Jesus is not God. Then they'll try and get you to argue as far as how you explain the Trinity. Okay, where is Trinity used in the Bible? Uh, where is that, you know, how is it that God could die? And, and you get these kinds of questions. Um, the Godhead is actually the term used that we would see in Scripture as far as with regard to Trinity. Uh, and that's taught all throughout. Uh, as far as how God could die, uh, can't explain it, but I know we're expressly uh, taught in Isaiah 53 with regard to the that division, where you have Isaiah writing down as far as what God had told him with regard to God's servant, who was not only high and lifted up, uh, but he was supposed to be bruised uh, for our iniquities. And then, uh, he was the one that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And he very clearly expressed that. Uh, you go through the Gospels, Jesus very clearly stated as well that he was to die. He had come here to die. He was going to be offering himself up. Uh, John, when he claimed, or excuse me, when he saw Christ coming, uh, his pronouncement was, you know, <laughs> behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Uh, so it's very something. It was something that was clearly understood. Uh, the fact that he had to offer himself, and he was and himself was going to die. And then uh, you have Psalm 22. You know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, how does that make sense with regard to uh, logically explaining? Okay, how does how does God die? <laughs> I don't know. I just know that. In scripture, we're told that this happened, uh, but in order for somebody to be saved, uh, and especially with regard to uh, false religion or cult that looks to their own works and looks to um, perverted teaching from scripture, um, they have to accept what God strictly uh, puts forth in His Word that Jesus is God. And that um, it was not only necessary for him to die, but he would raise again from the dead. Uh, and he's able to go ahead and uh, cleanse from sin. Does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> well, okay, uh, nobody has any questions? We'll be looking at, uh, well, actually, wait a minute. Pro Brother Dustin Duke is going to be coming next week, so he'll be here next week instructing. And then also, following that, we'll be looking at um, uh, Mormonism, what the Mormons teach, and then also we'll be looking at, following that, Islam and then the uh, Catholics, and then uh, what present day Judaism teaches, which differs greatly from. Uh, what biblical Judaism would have taught. Okay. No questions? No. Uh, we're uh, dismissed. It's a little early, I know. Miracles happen every week. <laughs> <laughs> we usually get out after the team, so. Yeah. We're making up.
Then you go back to school. Pete. 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 Pete.